Hello everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, first of its kind conference for uh, uh, giving me the possibility to present our work about uh, modeling of aging. So today I would like to describe the Aging Human Avatar, uh, a computational modeling platform to study neural correlates of aging. So what's the idea behind the, the avatar? So I myself am coming from computational modeling background and the aim of computational modeling is to link neural mechanisms on the single neuron level and the level of population of neurons to behavior. And I'm aware, and I think you are aware uh, of it too, that uh, right now uh, we have a wealth of uh, experimental data on uh, biological level of detail from single neurons to population of neurons uh, to behavior from different brain areas and to make uh, use of this data for analysis and prediction uh, in aging, we would like to have some tools to cross-link the data, to unify the experimental data, to build uh, uh, integrated models uh, ideally personalized models uh, of behavior. So um, here we, we, we try to, to do the first step in this direction by creating a software model of a, of a human that is moving in, in its 3D environment. Uh, and here you, uh, before I go into description, uh, here are the people who contributed to this work. So um, here's the architecture of the Aging Human Avatar platform. So first of all, we have a, a low-level communicating backbone of the of the platform, which is uh, called ROS. I will explain in a minute what it is. But in fact, uh, uh, it is just a, a low-level middleware to connect different components of this platform. And the, these different components are either interface modules, which are shown here below, or functional modules, which are shown here on top. And uh, each of these components can be written on, on a, in a different programming language, like Python or MATLAB or C. Uh, and uh, the ROS uh, backbone will just pass messages between these components. The, the interface modules are the 3D avatar in environment model, which basically is just a visualization of the avatar uh, movements uh, in the environment. Another interface module is, is called the user interface and data analysis and basically this is the control mode from which a user can start and stop a simulation. It can load parameters of the avatar into the system and extract data for, for, for the analysis. And the functional modules, which I will also describe in detail later, are the, um, uh, for now there are only three of them. So one of, it, of them is the early visual system is basically a retina and V1 cells. One of them is a, a is a is a model of cerebellum, which uh, in this in its current implementation takes care of the adaptation in vestibular ocular reflex. And the third module is about uh, spatial orientation. Okay, so now I will describe a little bit in more details each of those modules. So first of all, uh, a few words uh, about the ROS module. What is ROS? ROS, in fact, is um, stands for robotic operating system, even though it's not in fact an operating system, but it's just a set of software libraries, which, is, which are developed to, um, to create distributed robotic applications. Okay, we don't do any robots, but we, we used this ROS framework because of its flexibility, reliability, and modularity. It has been already tested uh, many times in complex applications, and because it's what's actually originated in Stanford in, in 2000 and now is a very well developed community and ecosystem. But in fact, um, for our avatar, we don't need all the functionalities of ROS because it's robot oriented. That's why we contributed to development of, of CROS, which is a lightweight project to emulate ROS functionality in a, in a single thread application. Okay, so, uh, and CROS is, is, a, is in GitHub and this is open source. So um, this ROS serves, as I said, just to pass messages between the modules and in particular in the avatar platform, it serves to pass messages in the forms of spike trains. For example, if, if you have a retinal module which simulates a spiking activity of retinal ganglion cells, these spiking activities can be um, passed as a message to another module, for example, uh, uh, visual spatial orientation module, and these will drive uh, cells in, in, in the brain that, that, uh, that are responsible for spatial orientation. And now I switch to the, to the interface modules. 
and let's see how the uh, Unity 3D avatar environment model works. So here, for example, you, you see a video of an experiment that was actually conducted in our lab uh, where uh, an aged person is navigating in a street lab environment. Again, okay, while he's navigating, we record the uh, using motion capture the position of the body and the gaze direction using eye tracker so that we can later reproduce these movements on a computer. Now, this motion tracking and eye tracking data can be uh, loaded into the avatar platform. So here you see the, the Unity interface uh, of the platform. And here's the, uh, here's the control interface where you basically start the simulation. And then the avatar will move in a realistic model of the, of the 3D environment in which the person actually navigating. So we can see what the subject sees while navigating. And if we include, the, for example, the retinal module into the avatar and we activate the model and connect avatar module to the retinal module, then uh, here we will see the, the spike output of retinal ganglion cells. Of course, these activities are, are just simulations of what we know about the retina, but you can already see that here we can test a certain number of things. For example, in uh, age-related dysfunction patients, for example, in the AMD, where you have a, a deficit in, in central vision, we can emulate this deficit and see how this deficit will affect eye movements, and spatial orientation function. Okay, this is one of the examples of what can be done here. Okay, another thing um, that we can do in the platform, uh, still in this um, avatar and the environment model, is to simulate the external equipment, for example, visual equipment like glasses. Okay, in this project, um, in collaboration with the Essilor, who is the leader in the development, a uh, world leader in development of progressive lenses, um, we use the avatar to actually simulate the distortion of visual input, uh, which uh, is caused by the subject wearing a, a progressive lens. Okay, so this lens, detailed lens model was provided to us by Essilor, and then we added this lens model to the avatar, and uh, see you see, uh, um, while subject is navigating in, in, the, in the environment, we see how the lens distorts the visual input, okay? And this is really relevant for aging because uh, in age subject who mostly wear uh, lenses, the lenses actually will distort the optic flow in the lower part of the field, which will affect balance and increase the risk of falls. Okay, so this is one of the ongoing projects. I described to you what we can do on the level of the avatar, and now I will pass to the description of the, of the functional modules. And um, the first one is the early visual system. So uh, this module is in fact a, a deep neural network which is created in a PyTorch library. So this is a standalone module of, of, the, of the avatar uh, platform which will simply take images from the avatar and that could be sinusoid gratings that are usually used in psychophysical experiments or it could be natural uh, images. And the retinal module is a, is a deep neural network which will uh, produce in a biologically plausible well manner because we in this module we, we can simulate different types of retinal cells and it will produce the output, uh, a spiking output. So this is the, uh, for example, the image uh, on the retina from this kind of natural input and this is the spiking output of retinal ganglion cells. We can also simulate uh, several layers of subsequent stages, for example, uh, this is the LGN output, um, which is just the filtered output of the retinal ganglion cells. So there are several uh, existing models of the retina, and the advantage of this model is that it can simulate arbitrary spatiotemporal receptive fields from the, on the retinal cells, and it can do this by using GPU. For example, we apply this model to try to answer the question what is the mechanistic cause of a decrease in contrast sensitivity? So we know from, from the psychophysical studies, for example, this study was conducted when Remy Alar was, was one of um, postdocs in the lab. He measured contrast sensitivity in young and old subjects. And uh, so here's the data. So the contrast sensitivity goes down for a certain uh, range of special frequencies. But in psychophysical experiment, you cannot actually tell what is the mechanistic reason for this decrease. 
Okay, so in this project, we, we took the retina module, as, as I shown before, and we added a cortical stage such that the retinal, uh, retinal ganglion cells project the spiking output to the V1 cells, and these V1 cells will develop uh, orientation sensitive receptive fields using STDP. This is the work of Tim Maskelia, who was also a researcher in the lab. And then, out of population activity of orientation sensitive cells, we can actually decode the orientation of the grating. Okay? And by changing the contrast of the grating, we can simulate the, the decision taken by the participants about the orientation of the grating at different levels of contrast. Okay? So, in this model, we can actually uh, simulate the contrast sensitivity function, which is here. And then, by changing the parameters of the model, and uh, in this project, we, we, uh, uh, we modified the sensitivity of the retinal cells uh, to, high to high spatial frequencies, and also uh, the number of cells, or the size of the receptive fields, and we tried to see what are the effects of these parameters on a contrast sensitivity function. So, we, uh, in this project, we tried to find mechanistic uh, explanations for the decreased contrast sensitivity in aging. Another module that we have in the, in the avatar, a neural model of a cerebellum. And in particular, we were interested in the role of the cerebellum in vestibular ocular reflex. Okay. So what is the vestibular ocular reflex? By, by inducing particular eye movements, the vestibular ocular reflex will compensate for involuntary movements of the head. Here, for example, in this video, this is what a, a, a patient sees and this patient has a deficit in vestibular ocular reflex. So when he's walking or driving, the involuntary movement of the head will induce oscillation of the visual field. Okay? And we know from um, epidemiological data, for example, from this study in Li et al., approximately until, until 80 years old, um, the vestibular ocular reflex gain is almost constant, but after 80 years old, it drops significantly. Again, this is epidemiological data, and we, we have absolutely no uh, idea of uh, why is this happening. This cerebellar module of the avatar platform uh, actually consists of the spiking network of the, of the cerebellum, um, which I'm not going to go into detail, and all the details of this model are in this publication. And uh, in this model, we studied again, as for the, as for the contrast sensitivity, we, we studied how different parameters of the model can can affect the uh, the war gain adaptation okay and what are the parameters of the model of course since we are interested in aging uh, we studied the the known effects of aging onto this network for example age related changes in pl in synaptic plasticity on the level of, of Purkinje cells is one possibility another possibility is, is the loss of vestibular input to the cerebellar network and these kinds of parameters we can we can change and see how these parameters will affect age related changes in the in the gain of vestibular ocular reflex. Uh, and moreover, what we can do here is to simulate longitudinal trajectory of different people. And for example, in this simulation where, where we simulate different people, we see that some people, depending on some setting of parameters, uh, um, the vestibular ocular reflex gain will decrease very strongly after 80. And for some person, it's not. We tried to uh, discover the neural factors which uh, cause different inter-individual inter differences in, in this um, war gain, and we made several experimentally testable predictions. This is a standard experiment in which uh, a vestibular ocular reflex is actually tested in humans. So the human is forced to, to rotate his head to left or to the right. So the head is oscillating, and... Um, eye movements are recorded. So you see that uh, in the beginning of training, the, the vestibular ocular reflex is not adapted, so the image is shifting on the retina, while at the end of training, the image is stabilized in spite of the fact that the uh, head is rotating. Okay? This is a normal vestibular ocular reflex adaptation, and if there is a deficit, then you will observe oscillations of the image even after prolonged learning. So finally, to, um, uh, to show a simulation in which um, several modules uh, can exchange messages together with each other, uh, I'll show you now a simulation in which the early visual system will send uh, spiking activities 
to another module, a visual special cognition module, which will uh, simulate the activities of, of the cells in the hippocampal formation that are thought to uh, be responsible for the sense of spatial or orientation. Okay, so basically in this model here, the visual activities from the retinal model are fed up to the, to the V1 cells as before. So the V1 cells will produce orientation-sensitive activities, and the population of orientation-sensitive activities during navigation will produce images like this. So it will extract edges from the scenes that are observed by the retina, and this population of these activities will represent, actually uh, encode a neural representation of the surrounding scenes. And then these neural representation of uh, scenes, which are thought to be uh, encoded on the level of the parietal cortex will then fed up to the hippocampal place cells we will actually learn current location of the participant while it's navigating in the experiment. This, this transformation of the visual input from the retinal to hippocampal uh, neurons occurs in this uh, spiking neural network which goes from early visual areas to the hippocampal cells. So this is, uh, this is the simulation and uh, here you see the subject, the avatar, in its environment. And uh, this environment is modeled exactly as the environment, experimental environment from the experiment that I showed you before. Uh, the avatar is made to move according to the motion tracking data and, and it will rotate its head according to uh, gaze tracking data such that the movements of the avatar reproduce as accurately as possible the movement of the subject. Okay. You see, this is how the actual subject moved in the environment in one of the trials. And here you see the input to the rating of ganglion cells, which is uh, by the ganglion cells spiking mechanism will be uh, converted to the, to the spiking activity on the output of the retina, as it happens uh, in real retinas. Okay, and uh, while the person will be navigating and obtaining this activity, this activity is fed up to the neural network that I showed you on the previous slide that will reach the hippocampus. And if I scroll forward a little bit, you will see here that while person is navigating in the environment, the hippocampal place cells will uh, activate in a particular location of the environment and the population, such the population of these cells will actually encode the location of the person in this environment. And uh, also grid cells will uh, encode the, the uh, self-motion information while the person is moving in this environment. This slide is just here to show you that, in fact, the, the Avatar project is, is a part of a bigger project, which is called the Silver Side Chair. And in this bigger project, we have a cohort of 350 subjects of different ages, from 20 to uh, about 95 years. On each of these subjects, we perform a set of uh, screening tests uh, in different experimental par paradigms that include the ophthalmological and functional visual screening. Here, for example, we measure the contrast sensitivity function uh, showed you before. Uh, we also perform experiments on eye movement control, on audio vestibular screening and balance. And here we try to relate this data to the, our model of vestibular ocular reflex. We also perform a set of experiments on neurophysiological screening for example, working memory, uh, figure memory, perspective taking, and so on, and a set of behavioral uh, measures, as I showed you in the previous experiment. So our hope is that, in fact, all this uh, multimodal data that we uh, record on our subject before the experiment and during the experiment, we can actually fed up to the avatar plot from, to try to cross-link this data. Of course, it's a very ambitious task, and for now we only... Uh, have pieces of this data linked together, as I showed you. But ideally, we would like to include as much as possible of this data in a single model and to make this model even personalizable, because, of course, uh, each subject has different um, measurements on, on each of these uh, uh, tests, and we could, in principle, uh, parameterize the avatar according to this data measured on, on each particular subject, and hopefully this will result in some kind of a personalized uh, age-based prediction. But this is, of course, a, a very remote uh, goal. So these are the conclusions from this talk. So I presented to you the Aging Human Avatar Platform, 
This is a software platform for data simulation, unification, and prediction. This platform is a modular and extendable distributed software and is based on state-of-the-art distributed libraries for robotic applications. And the objective of this avatar platform is, first of all, uh, to be able to reproduce in details the human behavior, both oculomotor and locomotor. And at the same time, the functional modules try to explain how this behavior will uh, uh, process and affect the processing uh, of uh, the activities of neurons in the related uh, brain areas. And right now the, we have only three modules that are related to, to, to visual activities, but uh, of course we would like this platform to be extended to include other sensory motor or cognitive modalities. Thank you.